Right. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. So uh, today we are going to present a talk on the topic decentralized federated machine learning and how can we empower edge devices uh, by leveraging Kubernetes. So we'll start with our introductions. Uh, my, my name is Hardik. I'm currently a, a graduate student at NYU pursuing my master's in computer science. And before joining NYU, I was uh, working as a developer at CIVO. Hi, everyone. I am Ikansh, and I am working with uh, Cygnos as a software engineer. And Cygnos is an open source uh, observability tool. Uh, so let's get started. Right. Let's get right into it. So uh, let's, let's actually start by looking at machine learning from a very high level. So how traditional machine learning systems have worked uh, till now is that there is, there's this device. Uh, we can consider it as a representative of an edge device. And the data processing happens on the device. And the device uh, sends the data to a central server. Now, this central server has our uh, machine learning model deployed on it, where actually the training, fine tuning, and all the machine learning magic happens. So the server, after receiving the feedback, probably retrains the model uh, on the data that it received and sends the predictions back to the device. So this is, again, a very uh, high-level view of how traditional machine learning uh, systems work. And um, we can scale this out to like uh, multiple devices or multiple edge devices uh, per se, wherein like multiple devices are sending feedback to just one global server where actually the compute and the deployed machine learning model is there. So this, this works fine, and this has been used by a lot of organizations, and this approach works just fine. But there are some challenges uh, that actually needs to be addressed here in, in this architecture. So the first major challenge that we'll talk about today is uh, what if all the data is not available on a centralized server, right? So uh, many organizations are uh, located in like various countries, and there, there can be regula regulations that like protect sensitive data from being moved around. And uh, or this, this will affect the training because if, say, our server is deployed in, in one country and we cannot receive data from like other countries, so the, there's, there's a limitation on the data that we can train on that server, right? Uh, the second challenge that we are looking to address here is what about the privacy? So um, in, in this case, uh, the users don't, don't care about what's going in behind the scenes, right? Users, uh, the users care about uh, that no, da no data should leave my phone, right? Uh, no sensitive data should leave my phone. So whenever we like type our passwords or you know our credit card info, we don't want it to be stored on like any central server, right? And in fact, uh, privacy was one of the major reasons that federated learning uh, uh, was actually invented in the first place. Uh, next challenge we'll talk about here is latency. So in the diagram that we saw earlier in this one, we can see that every time a device is sending feedback to the server and the server is sending predictions back to that, that device. Uh, every time the device sends a feedback to the server, it's making a network call to the server. And we can imagine how many network calls uh, will be made if there are like n number of devices. And network calls are expensive, so latency is, all, uh, latency is also affected in this case. So with that being said, how do we actually like address these challenges, right? Uh, we can, uh, so this is where like federated machine uh, federated learning comes into place. So it is a machine learning paradigm that uh, facilitates the training of models across a, a network of decentralized devices. So we, as we can see, what is happening here is that uh, there, are, there are multiple devices which we call clients in federated learning, as we'll see in the uh, demo uh, very soon. And each device is here is responsible for training on its own local data, which means the computation here is actually happening on the device and not on the global server, as we saw earlier. So yeah, each node, which means in our case is the device, contribute to the model's learning process, and it only trains on the local data of, of itself. And uh, the, the privacy issue that we saw earlier is being addressed here because there's actually no transfer of data from any client to a server. And yeah, this enables collaborative learning uh, while actually like keeping the raw data at its source, which is the device. And uh, this helps in addressing the privacy and security concerns. Right, so till now, like, uh, we have been very verbose about what uh, traditional and federated machine learning is, so let's just trim it down and uh, bring it in one line. So traditional machine learning, in traditional machine learning, we actually moved the data to where the computation was situated. And in federated, we moved the computation to where the data already exists and just train it on that data. So again, this was like very theoretical approach of it. 
so now we'll actually look at uh, what are the what are the steps in which we can uh, leverage federated learning so let's start by step 0 step 0 is this this step is like very similar to what we do in uh, central machine learning uh, we we just initialize the global model uh, on the server and initialize the model parameters so because this is the same as what we do in traditional machine learning let's just call it step 0 uh, it starts it the federated learning actually starts from here so we send the model to a number of to, to the to all the clients that are connected to our server right so uh, by sending models i mean sending the parameters or uh, other other like machine learning uh, things to uh, all the clients also uh, we need to ensure that each client uh, starts their local training using the same model parameters so that is important so this is just the initialization step step 2 is each client trains the model locally on their own data so again as i mentioned we can see that like training is happening on the client devices and not on the global server so there might be a question like why do we even need the global server right i'll i'll come to that in like in the next two slides right so after the local training is done what will happen is each client will have a different version of the model parameters that it originally received. Now, why will the parameters be different? They will all be different because like uh, each client nodes will have different uh, examples in its local data set. So, so yeah, and every client, so uh, notice that we are not sending any data back to the server. We are sending the model updates, which means like the updated weights or the gradients, we, we are sending it back to the server. Right. And yeah this is the this is the most important part and where like the servers fun uh, servers function come into play so the server receives the model up uh, updates from the uh, client nodes so if the server like selected uh, 100 client nodes it will now have 100 different slightly different version of the model parameters that it sent originally but that is not a goal right our goal is to get a single model which is which will actually uh, uh, which is, which will actually have all the updated weights so in order to in order to have that we have to like combine all the uh, model updates into just one single model and that process is called aggregation so what aggregation uses it, it uses federated averaging which like takes the weighted average of all the weights and updates so if a client has been trained on 100 examples and if some other client has been trained on 1000 examples we can't weight them the same right so that is what federated averaging is and we'll explain it more uh, when we look into the demo Right, and the step five is just repeat all the steps until you are done. And steps one to four each, uh, steps one to four in itself is called like one round of federated learning and we can uh, run it for multiple rounds. So these were like the exact, exact steps of how federated learning works. And yeah, with that, I'll hand over to Vikansh. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so uh, till now we have had a lot of uh, uh, tools and frameworks for federated machine learning. And one of the most uh, like used tools till now was FATE, which is federated AI uh, technology enabler. Uh, so why did it got famous? Why was it used by everyone? It was used because it actually ensures privacy and it ensures secure federated learning. Uh, yeah, and uh, so this is uh, all about FATE right now. But coming to the next part, let's talk about the FATE architecture. So the FATE architecture has a couple of things. Uh, for me, it looks a very similar architecture to Airflow, but it's not. Uh, and I will tell you why. So the FATE board is nothing but a GUI, uh, where you can see all the visualizations that are happening in the FATE, uh, in the FATE uh, architecture. Uh, yeah, we can do all the monitoring, we can do uh, all the uh, visualizations on the FATE board. Now, come to the FATE flow. On the FATE flow, uh, what we do is we keep all the uh, data there, like what has to be done on the federated side, uh, what is the strategy to be used, and uh, what are the metadata of information uh, of how the federated learning has to be done. On the DB side, all the metadata is stored on the DB. And uh, uh, in later slides, we will see a different architecture to FATE uh, where there is no use of DB. 
coming to the next part, we have uh, federated ML, which will have all the algorithms and the models, uh, which will distribute it to the pods and the edge devices of how it has to be uh, run as a machine learning model. So uh, let's just say we have to distribute weight somehow uh, based on the compute power of every edge device. So let's say we ha uh, earlier Hardik said that one edge device might have 100 examples and another edge device might have around 1,000 examples. So that is determined on the basis of what the compute is available on each edge device. And uh, we can just say that uh, every edge device or every unit of uh, compute is being called egg roll on the fate architecture. Coming to the next slide, uh, yeah, so what is QFIT? QFIT is nothing. Uh, whenever you have any framework, any framework, and you just write cube in front of it, it means that we can run it on uh, Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, so the QFIT facilitates uh, orchestration of fate using both Docker Compose and Kubernetes. So it has cage deploy as the deployment approach is specifically tailored for the production of uh, scalable solutions on Kubernetes. Uh, we can look how we deploy fake clusters on cage, uh, and we can go to uh, GitHub repo for that, uh, which is github.com slash federated AI slash uh, Now the thing is that uh, QFIT has been very mature product till now. It has been on version 2.0 since January, and there has been no further developments on the same. Therefore, uh, what I like more is FLAR. So FLAR is a very new framework uh, which brings in federated learning. And currently, it is being used for academic institutions and scientific research. Uh, so FLAR has a very different architecture to what play, FATE has right now. Uh, and we will show you in the next slide. So yeah. So this is a very nice architecture here. So what happens is, in a real world deployment, what we want to do is, in a federation, we want a different hyperparameters, uh, different model architectures, and different aggregation strategies. Therefore, what uh, FLAR has done is that FLAR has uh, split the client side and the server side into two parts. One is very transient in nature, very short-lived. And the second one is a very long-lived thing. So on the server side, we have a server app and the superlink. And uh, the superlink is used for uh, inst like. Uh, putting all the instructions to the super node, which will come into the client side, and receive all the tasks from, uh, back from the super node. The server app is a short-lived short process uh, with project-specific codes like uh, client selection, uh, client configuration, and result aggregation. Uh, coming to the client side, we have super node and client app. On the super node, we have the, so all the super processes are long running processes. So the super node is also a long running process uh, that connects to the super link and talks to the super link about how we have to uh, do our ML training. Uh, and let's just say super link has said, train this model on your local data. Uh, super node will provide that information to the client app. So client app is the short-lived uh, process here, which will do all the federated machine learning applications here, local model training, pre- and post-processing of all the uh, ML. Coming to the next slide, we have Kubeflare. As previously mentioned, uh, put Kube in front of any framework. We can deploy it on <laughs> Kubeflare, uh, sorry, Kubernetes. So Kubeflare is uh, nothing but uh, just uh, some set of operators that can, ease, that can help us or enable us to uh, deploy Flare on uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters and edge devices. Uh, yeah. So let's come to the Kubeflare architecture. Uh, it's a good architecture. So we have a server pod. Uh, so the server is uh, what we discussed earlier. Uh, that handles all the data, uh, like uh, what has to be done. The client is handling all the uh, training and everything. And then there is a service server in between, uh, which is exposed on 8080, which is gRPC, uh, and it is being listened by Flar server. Uh, the other port, the service port, which is 30051, is an HTTP uh, port, which is being used by the client pod for its uh, communication. 
so all the model aggregation, the model update, the client's management is done on the uh, server pod. All, all the local data training and the updated local model uh, data is being uh, done on client pod. Yeah, so let's come to the demo. We have a huge, okay, okay. Just a minute. Quick time clear. Okay. The problem is that I can't see it from here, but that is not a very big deal. So what is happening here? Uh, yeah, so right now we are doing nothing but just doing a Minikube start. So we are initializing a, a Kubernetes cluster on our Docker. And we have to mention the CPUs and the memory uh, in it because uh, the thing is that we were doing the demo yesterday. And uh, we found out that if we are using Minikube on, our def on default settings, it is too less of CPU and memory to actually complete the training. So we are using, uh, so, in uh, just a minute. Yeah, so in like uh, when we go into the video, we will see that we are using Cypher 10 for our uh, training and uh, testing. So uh, even though we have trimmed it down to approximately 10,000 images, still it was taking more than like five hours to do so. So that is why on Minikube we have to specify how much resources we have to put and uh, Right now, uh, we uh, have ample of resources so that we can do this uh, in a well-timed manner, although this video is a 45-minute video and we will uh, fast forward it. But uh, yeah, we can connect multiple edge devices to, fast, uh, to make it more fast as well. Uh, coming to the next part, uh, yeah. So we are going to build uh, the Qflower image, and this is going to come from the Docker Hub. Uh, so let's just wait while it builds the image of Qflower. Yeah. So we can see on the last uh, line we have docker.io slash library slash Qflower latest. Uh, and uh, Qflower is coming from the Docker Hub. Yeah. So we are using a server service.yaml. Yeah. And this, uh, go to the presentation. Yeah, so now we are uh, controlling the service server and we are exposing port 8080 on that uh, when I show it on uh, the video and 30.051 for HTTP ports. Yeah, so as mentioned before, uh, we have port 30.051 and target port as 8080 uh, for the service server. Uh, once that is done, we are going to do a server deploy.yaml uh, that is nothing, but we are going to uh, run the server and mentioning the server.py file here, and we are going to tell that to use 8080 server on the service server uh, deployment. Here, uh, you can see we have a weighted average method uh, coming down. We have a lot of arguments that we have to pass. Uh, we are using the default arguments right now with uh, two clients and five retries. Uh, five tries, like five epochs, and uh, we are using the federated average strategy, uh, which is the default strategy with Flar right now. Yeah. Okay, coming to the next thing, we are just going to check if everything is all right, and we can see that we have a service server service, uh, and a deployment on Flar server, and we also have a Flar server port coming up. Uh, now we are going to deploy the client.yaml. So on the client.yaml, we are showing that we are going to run the uh, client.py file and we are going to enable it on 30051. Uh, we are, yeah. So right now we are uh, creating the neural network. Uh, it's a def like normal neural network. We have the train method, we have the test method, and we have the load data method. Uh, can you just go back? Yeah, pause. Pause. Yeah, so here we can see that we are using CIFAR 10. Uh, select on CIFAR 10. Okay, 
Uh, now we are passing in the arguments of what the port is going to be, what are the server, what are the data that we have to send it to, and uh, uh, we are just going to start the uh, parameters. We are going to set the parameters, get the parameters. Uh, we are going to use the method for fit and evaluate, and we are going to start the client. Uh, so the flower client is created. If we see the uh, we see the kubectl get all, we have the uh, flower server flower client as deployments. We have two flower clients and one flower server, as mentioned previously. That uh, by default uh, there are two clients with five epochs each. Uh, so we can assume each pod of a flower client as uh, an edge device uh, where the compute is being happened. OK, so we are going into K9S to see the logs. Uh, we go to the server logs. We are checking. And we have, uh, just wait a minute. Yeah, so we are on uh, step zero, if you remember previously. So here, Just a minute. Where is my mouse? Hmm. So if we go there, we have step zero. So initialize the global model. So the global model is being initialized here. Uh, yeah, so the initial parameters are given, the evaluation is being started, and the evaluation results are none. Uh, let's move it forward and yeah, 10x. Continue. Yeah. On the client side, we can see that we are connected to 30051. Uh, we are also seeing some messages that uh, some of the NumPy clients are deprecated, but uh, that's not a problem here right now. It's going to be fine afterwards. Uh, we are also seeing that Cypher 10 has been uh, uploaded, and uh, we can start the training now. Let's move it forward. We are short on time. Move it, yeah. So aggregate fits are done, uh, so with zero failures. And uh, we are seeing a warning here. Uh, yeah, we are seeing the warning here, which says no fit metrics aggregation uh, provided. And that is because this was done for the first time, and there was no current weights till now. That is why this warning is coming. Once the round two, round three, or round four comes, there will, no, uh, there, there will not be a warning there. Continue. Uh, yeah, so we can see that we have done 0 of 1563, 1 of 1563 epochs, uh, and uh, all the things. Uh, the reply has been sent, and uh, an evaluate message has been come from the server side. Let's fast forward it. Come to the end. Yeah, come to the end. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so here, just a minute. Next, forward, forward. Where we see the weights? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are not able to <laughs> control this. Yeah, so we have. So we have finished five epochs, and we can see that the error in round one was 1.92, and till round five we have come down at uh, uh, we have uh, decreased it to 1.31. The accuracy has gone down from 30% to approximately 52%. Uh, right? Yeah. So we. Yeah, so here we have done five rounds, and it took us 45 minutes to do so while recording. Uh, if we have go, if we might have gone till like round 20, it might have crossed 90% and above accuracy. 
Yeah, continue. On the client side, we can see some data as well, the logs. Uh, uh, fast forward. Yeah, here we have seen that uh, we have re uh, received a train message, the evaluate message, the train message, the evaluate message five time on each of the uh, epochs, and it has sent their data. So the training is done on 1563 uh, examples, and the evaluation has been done on 10,000 examples. And on each epoch, that has uh, the data has been sent to the uh, server side. And I think we are done with the demo. So yeah, do you have any questions? Yeah, we still have one minute, like 40 seconds. Uh, you can uh, put the feedback on that QR. Uh, you can connect us with uh, uh, both of us on Twitter, or X, whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, apologies for the demo. Uh, that was haphazard. Yeah. Does Kubefeed provides any uh, internal tooling to observe CPU and memory consumption when the model is being trained? Uh, so Kubefeed and Kubeflare both provides uh, CPU and memory uh, like observability on that. Uh, okay, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, I think we are done. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>